Like most comic nerds, I would go to the comic shop and I would flip through pretty much every comic just to see if there was some little gem somewhere. What is this? Looks like some kind of scrawny Doc Savagey looking guy with a rocket pack and he's got that Commando Cody helmet. This is amazing. And I did something that I don't think I've ever done before. I bought a book for the back cover. I saw the Rocketeer and I was just like, God, this guy can draw. This was a portal into a world of imagination and artistry that turned me on in a way that nothing else has. That was the world's introduction to Dave. And it's like, well, where the hell did he come from? I'm a real perfectionist to where I know what I want out of it, and I demand everything out of myself. I want to keep trying new things, new angles, new ways of telling a story. Dave definitely lived his life the way he drew. Everything had to be perfect, to a fault. To this day, I don't know that anyone has achieved what he's achieved with the brush. Each character has a soul. This is very difficult for an artist to give a soul to the character you draw. Every artist wants to make a connection with people. They want to do their thing, put it out there, and hope and pray that somebody cares. Dave's work really opened up my eyes to a wider horizon. Dave is really in some ways single-handedly responsible for bringing the world's attention back to Betty Page. Like any artist, and the reason he's getting a documentary made about him is because his art says a lot. My dearest and very best friend, Dave Stevens, was born on July 29th, 1955 in Southern California. We had started together in kindergarten. I didn't have a uh, father growing up, so Dad Stevens was pretty much my father. And Dave was like my brother. Dave's dad was the sweetest, nicest guy. Dave got his tremendous good looks from his mom. His parents were religious and he wasn't. All, well, I should rephrase that, he wasn't all that religious. Dad Stevens was very stoic. And I think that had a, an influence on David. The art gene came from our dad. Dave had described him as kind of a frustrated artist. Dave took it to the nth degree, whereas, you know, his dad was just doing it as a hobby. He was a unique character. He had a vision born of America's pop culture. As far back as I can remember, I was only interested in bizarre stuff. You <laughs> know, monsters and rocket ships and uh, things that aren't really of this world. And, of course, he loved to draw. That was all he ever did. First, I wanted to do cartoons, moving comics, and then I wanted to do comic comics. And then when I got older, I wanted to do painting and fine art and become an artiste. I would go over to his house, and he'd have some layout, and he would be complaining. And I said, what's wrong with this? This is perfect. And he said, no, it's not. The only sort of ticket I had was the fact that I could draw. My freshman year of high school, my teacher would tell people, oh, yeah, David's forte is the figure. It was sort of duly noted by each successive teacher in art that I had that, oh, watch this kid. He made this for me as kind of his going away. He told me in parting that he's going to keep an eye on me. I cherish this. This was very important to me. In February, March of 72, my family moved to San Diego. I went to a city college downtown for a couple semesters and took some art classes. I knew that I needed more schooling. There was a lot of class assignments, things that weren't necessarily what he would be drawing if he had his choice. There's no way he would have decided, hey, I'm going to draw a loaf of bread. <laughs> you need to learn about composition and design and everything from the ground up. I had no real drawing skills. I could fake it, but I couldn't really do anatomy. And I knew nothing about perspective. I just was completely helpless. In San Diego, Dave was at those early Comic Cons and got to meet both some of his artistic heroes, but then also other young guys who sort of rose up in the business with him. One of the things about Comic Con is that people who might never have met each other in life not only met, but their whole lives changed because of being at that one event for a few days. 
When I first got involved with the San Diego Comic Con, I was 18 years old, and the first person I saw was Dave Stevens. And I'm like, ooh, he's cute. Little did I know that we would get married seven years later. I met Dave working on the San Diego Comic Con. We both did a lot of drawings for the program book. Dave was someone I noticed right away from the convention booklet. I was immediately taken with his inking. I did little tiny ads for papers and stuff, you know, whoever would pay for some kid that didn't really know what he was doing. I also hired him to work for me. I had penciled a ad for a Bob's Comics. He, of course, pulled it together when he inked it and just made it beautiful. Everybody who ever met Dave in his early days recognized his talent, even though they were still in a formative state. At the 73 con, Neil Adams was doing these informal portfolio reviews. He said, are those your samples? And I said, uh, yeah, but you're, you're getting ready to leave. You don't have time. And he says, well, will you take the time I give you? Neil Adams was enormously discouraging to some people who he just simply felt had no talent and ought to be told that bluntly. He came to some black and white ink drawings, and then I was astonished to see that the artist was Dave Stevens. He flipped through it, looking and commenting on each piece. And at the end of it, he said, you could ink for Marvel, <laughs> just, just like that. He said, I'll send it back east. I think he was 18 at the time. I was the grand old age, 23 or 4 and Dave caught his attention. It took maybe a couple of months before he got the samples back. There was no letter, just a note on the outside saying, not ready, underlined. But at least I knew that the stuff got looked at. I'm kind of glad I didn't get any work then because I needed at least two or three more years to hone my chops with a brush. I just didn't have it. My break into comics was with Russ Manning. He was looking for somebody to assist on the Tarzan strip, so I went up and he seemed to think I'd fit the bill. Russ figured out early on that Dave could ink the whole thing and make him look better than he actually looked. I worked for him in 75 and part of 76. I suffer burnout really easily, really quick. At that point, I was so completely dried out and <laughs> exhausted after a year and a half of deadline, deadline, deadline. I just knew that I didn't have the temperament for it. I just decided to turn to film work and storyboard gigs and advertising. In fact, why I moved to L.A. in the late 70s. It was the only kind of work that I could get with my skills. In all of my experiences in animation, I never had once anybody say, where do you go to school? They want to see the work, and if it's good and you don't seem like a nut, you've got the job. I was 22 at the time when I started at Hanna-Barbera. In animation, it didn't matter where you came from, as long as you could mimic the style on whatever model sheet you were looking at. It was a fun place to be if you could deal with the fact that there was always someone running around yelling, faster, cheaper, faster, cheaper. A lot of artists were not happy to be part of an assembly line. When I first was on my own in Hollywood, I was all enthusiasm, I was all gung-ho, and if somebody said, can you do this? I would say, absolutely. <laughs> I can start today. When Dave was at Hanna-Barbera, he was doing layout, and layout in the animation process is a series of poses designed for the animator to work from. Here's one of Dave's layouts. This shows just how detailed Dave was because the typical layout is more of a sketch, but there's no real flair to it like this. Dave was the slowest guy in the building, and he would have been the first one to tell you that. I'd be up visiting the guys in the layout department. An artist would go, God, I'm tired. I did 80 scenes yesterday. And somebody else would say, oh, I did 60 scenes. And Dave would say, I did five. Dave wasn't goofing off. He was working as hard as anybody, and he got a lot of grief from the other artists. The key was, he was by far the producer's favorite artist. Doug Wildey was an outstanding cartoonist who created Johnny Quest. He kind of became Dave's mentor. Doug had this real dry wit and also was a bit cantankerous. He was a true curmudgeon. A lot of that rubbed off on Dave. Fortunately, he was doing non-creative stuff with a lot of like-minded, extremely talented people, and all of them fed into Dave's skill level and his goals. He was overqualified for the job, but he liked the camaraderie of work alongside a Russ Heath. 
or a Mike Sikowski or an Alex Toth. You can't imagine the talent that they had there, but it never reflected on the screen because they had to do them so fast and they were so cheap. But man, they had some guys. Whew. A lot of the comic book artists who worked at Hanna-Barbera, a great example of what Dave did not want to grow up to be because there were wonderful artists there who were spending their lives chasing job after job, doing work that they had no emotional interest in. One of the reasons I went back to advertising was just I got so fed up and frustrated every time I went in to try and get something past the directors and past the animators. It's not real encouraging. Dave had his whole career ahead of him in a business which was becoming more artist friendly. Comics were fun, but I certainly didn't want to make it my life's work. I only got into it when people would run into deadlines and they would call me up and say, hey, can you take uh, four pages of this story? And, you know, and I would fill in on Star Wars or whatever it was. Rick Hoberg did type pencils and I inked. We only had a week to do it, so lots of different people worked on that job. But the main helper was Dave. We knew if he inked the close-ups of Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford that they would be spot on. Dave's also an inked Russ Manning on the Star Wars strips. Whenever I ink somebody else's work, and I don't just sit down and mechanically go over the pencil lines. I'll go over it and see what I think needs to be brought out and what needs to be toned down and make it something that I enjoy working on. And if it's bad drawing, I'll go back and erase a lot of the drawing. And if it's good drawing, I'll try and make it better. If you knew Dave's style, you could really see his rendering in those Star Wars strips. The only time I had gone ahead and done anything in comics at all after working for us was Aurora for Sanrio. They were putting together a book, a Japanese audience is geared toward young girls. It was the first time Dave was being compensated well enough to spend the time to get the work to be the best it could be. He proceeded to take so long, the company had gone belly up, the whole operation had stopped functioning long before he turned it in. I started modeling for Dave in 1977. I think that I was the first model he'd ever worked with. For Dave, having Brink Stevens as the model was an inspiration. Not only commercial reasons, but emotional reasons. That was certainly part of the courting process. For a time, she was the only female at Comic-Con. Brink was in charge of the masquerade, and she would put on performances as the intermission. Dave noticed her, and they began a relationship. I don't know if she exactly played hard to get, but it took him a while. Dave had been in love with me pretty much since the first time he saw me. I really felt like I was a muse to him. He loved to photograph me. Most of the time, though, he wanted me to model nude. He said it was so that he could draw on his own clothing later, but I think he just really wanted to see me naked. <laughs> Before they got engaged, Dad was exasperated with him. It was like, marry the girl or break up with her. Make something happen. A few years ago, I shared a studio with Bill Stout and uh, Richard Hescox, and we worked together very well. We were hoping to have a West Coast version of the East Coast studio, which had Jeff Jones, Bernie Wrightson, Barry Smith, and Mike Kaluta. Bernie could draw like a king, draw circles around the moon. We initially started talking about sharing a studio together, he and I, but it was an economic necessity, having other people come in on it. We started to think, wow, this is something kind of special happening. We decided, how about we do our own powerhouse team with us three guys? It was just this wonderful synthesis of our three different personalities. It was uh, inspirational to be in the same room with two other artists that you respect. You kind of bounce ideas off of each other. We became the hottest studio in LA. Top name film directors, actors, writers, magicians, musicians, they all wanted to see the studio or hire us to work for them. By virtue of the fact that each one of you is very good at what he does, it keeps you on your toes. It makes you want to do your best, your very best work. We were very open about criticizing each other's works. If something was wrong, we would tell you. Dave learned a lot from those guys, but it did, I think, bother him, you know, a little bit that he wasn't professionally trained. Dave, of course, started with his innate talent. It was there. It was enough for him to be self-taught and still be good. Whether that led to him feeling insecure I'm not sure that that was something he should have worried about. 
Gilbert and I was like, what do you need school for? Just draw. That was because that was where we came from. Just do it, man. Look at it. There's your piece of paper. There's your pencil. And Dave would just like. <laughs> I always felt really, really outgunned by Stout and other artists that could compose a scene. And I really had to struggle with it. I didn't really start to smarten up about growing as an artist until around the time I was doing storyboards on Raiders. When I was working on Conan the Barbarian and moonlighting on Raiders of the Lost Ark, it quickly became clear that I needed to totally focus on Conan. I went to Steve and I said, look, I can recommend a friend of mine to replace me. His name is Dave Stevens. I think he'd do a great job. Plus, he loves that period of time. Stephen hired him on the spot. And that's how Dave started boarding for Spielberg. Dave's perfectionism was certainly one of the things that I believe made him great. The only reason it held him back, and he would always admit this, he was not a fast artist. He was making it perfect to his standard, and I don't know if that ever happened. Every panel had to be a work of art. Steven would hand me his little X's and zeros and sticks and, and say, this is what I want the scene to look like. Mm -hmm. And then I would draw all the action. Steven Spielberg would think that they were great and say, oh, more detail, more detail. I want these to be the best storyboards that have ever been drawn. Dave knew that was because Steven Spielberg had every intention of taking those storyboards home with him. Lucas had come in and go, what are you doing? We got to, you know, we got to come back, come on. These things are just down and dirty. Which storyboards generally are. They, they don't have to be pretty. So he's between the two of them. One would tell him to take longer, and the other would come in and tell him to hurry it up. Kind of made him a little crazy. He was making really good money for a young man, and he said, let's get married. I can finally afford it now. The two of them enjoyed playing house, but I don't think they ever talked about what they really wanted out of a marriage with one another. Dave and I got married in July of 1980. We had less than 40 people at the wedding. We wrote our own vows, and my mother made sandwiches later, which we ate back at the apartment that we shared. So it was pretty low key, just really romantic. In the beginning, I wasn't too sure of her because I thought she was taking advantage of Dave, but Dave had a long talk with me about her and said, look, this is the way it is. I'm like, okay, as long as I know you're not getting screwed over, Brink's a nice person. I just didn't want to see you get hurt. Soon as we got married, things changed. Dave did not want me to have a career. He wanted me to be a wife. There was a lot of conflict from the get-go. I remember my parents being on the phone with Dave a lot. Dave just talked about what a <laughs> disaster their marriage was. He especially didn't like me having an acting career, doing glamor modeling for photographers. He just said, we were young. We shouldn't have done it. I came home one day, and they were carting Dave's furniture out. Dave said, I'm leaving you before you can leave me. And he did. Even though Dave and I got divorced in 1982, we stayed best friends and lovers for the rest of the 80s. I modeled a lot for him. And by leaving me, he forced me to go out and make something of my life through the love and the divorce, Dave got me where I am today, and I thank him for that. Between animation and storyboarding and advertising, the question of comics never came up again at all until the San Diego Con in 81. Dave knew Bill Shanus and Steve Shanus from Pacific Comics, from his association with Comic-Con. They just had a book that they were about to launch with Mike Grell called Star Slayer, but I think it was short by six pages. Prior to Pacific Comics, the comics world had been very oppressive to creators. The Shanuses said, you signed this deal with us. It's only two installments of half a dozen pages. How tough could it be? And you'd own it. I wouldn't have to surrender up in perpetuity all rights what are the ingredients of success? It's the artist, it's the creator, it's the characters, it's the setting, it's how it's presented, it's the time that it's unleashed on the world. He likes serials, he liked the adventure theme, the good guy getting the girl in the end, and he incorporated that whole thing into his comic. Jungle girls, masked villains, rocket man. Commando Cody, Sky Marshal of the Universe. 
I grew up on those, and Rocket Man was my hero when I was about five. You know, I made a little mask and flew around the backyard, like everybody did, I'm sure. We were also young and clueless that Dave thought it was in the public domain, but none of us were sure. So Dave said, well, I'll take it home and fix it up so we don't get sued. He probably looked at something like Commander Cody and said, I really loved that as a kid, but it sure looks dorky now. How can I take it and do it for today's generation? It's about a pilot, an aviator, who stumbles onto a device in the pre-war years that enables him to fly without a plane. I wanted to base it in more of a real world, just normal people with this one gadget thrown into the mix. And how would these people respond and deal with it? He took everything that he liked, the cars, the airplanes, the movie serial aspect. That taught me that you can put what you kind of love all into one, one work. I felt that maybe if I could put together a good enough idea, the Rocketeer may have a chance, and again, it may not. All of us artists were egocentric because we actually think other people might want to see what we do. Then every time we're in the middle of a painting or a drawing, it's like, is that good enough? I work until I get a good drawing. Sometimes it takes one day, two days, three days, four days. You know, it depends on what the drawing is and how much trouble I'm having with it. Dave said that his harsh self-criticism of his drawing came from the flashes of inspiration where he saw how good it could be. It's a tremendous amount of work, more work than comic books deserve. Comic books are not made to be fine art pieces. Oh my God. He would noodle out something on a page and go, wow, that's pretty good. And he'll do it like 10 minutes. It'll be like, OK, I want it to pose like this, look like that. Six months later, it's like, I'm still inking the eyebrow. And I'm erasing it every other day and re-inking it. And it's like, oh, you're killing me. So yeah, his process was very lengthy. You know when it's right, you know when it's not right. It may not be wrong or bad, but you go, hmm, something. Dave was making his art for himself. He wanted it to be the way that he wanted it to be, and he worked best with no deadlines and no um, expectations. Being an artist, a lot of that is kind of like living a fantasy world of what you really want to be. You're not going to be an adventurer, so you draw adventures. Maybe you won't make movies, but you'll make your own little movies on your comic book page. It's wonderful to entertain children with children's books, but if you can entertain and enthrall an adult over and over and over again, there's no price on that. I would get a new issue of The Rocketeer, I'd read it, and then I'd go back and just each page take it in, just enjoying it. I think and I hope I'm catering to a different audience, people who just want to read something that's kind of fun. It was a, an immediate success. Hey, it's The Rocketeer. It started off as popular as you could imagine and grew from there. One of our real supporters was a comic store in Las Vegas. Dave was going to do guest signings there of his Rocketeer stuff. The time Dave was supposed to be there had passed, and they're waiting, where's Dave, where's Dave, who's Dave? Dave decided he was going to dress for the occasion. Suddenly, in the distance, they see this beautifully restored 30s car with Dave dressed as the Rocketeer riding on the sideboards. I thought, man, that's really a fantastic way to enter. Nobody that i seen has had as much fun with it as Dave did. Dave's aesthetic was all in storytelling. That's why the characters in the, they were unique. Cliff was a reluctant hero. He was kind of bratty and selfish and then kind of ended up being a good person in spite of himself. You know, somebody who's really not that special, but has a, an inherent quality that's good. And I think everybody does. And every now and then, when put to the test, it shows and he doesn't have any superpower, but he comes through with a little <laughs> broken arm here and there. That's the thing that kind of makes him an interesting character. He's a schmuck. You know, Cliff is a schmuck. He's this very self-centered guy, and he's kind of scrawny, and he's good looking like Dave, and he looks like Dave, he looks like young Dave, but he's not a hero. The early sketches, with the helmet off, he didn't look that much like Dave. With every preceding sketch, he looked a little more like Dave. The Rocketeer, even though it was about a rocket pack, was really the story of us. Minus the rocket pack, this is Dave Stevens life. He put the people and the things he liked into it, the wildest PV. 
and of course, Betty Page. If the character was Dave Stevens, the ideal woman was Betty Page. He was fascinated by the 1940s, 1950s model, Betty Page. And Betty Page had been totally forgotten by everybody. He used her as the, as the image for the Rocketeer's girlfriend, Betty. She's been my ideal female figure since I was a kid. I really had no idea who Betty Page was. Then Dave showed me some 1950s pinup magazines that she was in, and I got it. I don't know what he was seeing or what he was experiencing, except that I know it was genuine, absolutely genuine. Betty's like the beginning of it all. Marilyn Monroe had predecessors, but Betty didn't. She brought a whole new sexuality to the forefront and then became an occult type of personality during the 70s and 80s. She had a playful but sultry girl next door kind of quality. She looked like she'd be equally good in the bedroom as in the kitchen. For me, it was like, who is this woman? God, she's got like the brightest smile and the most wholesome attitude I've ever seen for a gal who did skin flicks and burlesque. She's playing it to the hilt and she's doing it with great sense of humor. Being around Dave, you couldn't help but seeing photographs of her and you couldn't help seeing her show up in his drawing of women. For something that I originally started as a kind of a little private thing for me, you know, I know it's Betty Page, ha <laughs> ha uh, ended up to where most of the mail, it seems like every other letter mentions her by name. Even a lot of the younger kids know her. I would probably have to say I first became aware of Betty Page from Dave's work. I would never even knew who she was or had seen a photograph of her or anything. I remember seeing Dave's art first before I realized Betty Page was an actual human being and not a pinup girl, you know, not somebody's fantasy artwork. Most people knew her from the Rocketeer. And for them to suddenly discover that she actually existed, a lot of these fans would be like finding out Spider-Man really did exist. Sometimes you wander into these truths backwards. And then all of a sudden, you realize she's been in front of your eyeballs forever. Steve Shane has called me and says, we have a lot of fan mail here. <laughs> when he told me that, look, these people are all assuming that there's going to be follow-up. I wasn't prepared to do that, even for one more. Well, to the Shaneses, I mean, they smelled profit. If they could convince me to do it, his astoundment went to the fact that he had to produce more. There wasn't enough Rocketeer to support an ongoing periodical, let alone monthly. For Dave to maintain anything remotely approaching that schedule was just impossible. They just say, give us a new Rocketeer by such and such a date. <laughs> and, and I never do. We always blow the deadline by at least a month. Part of the frustration we had with Dave's speed was because the market was clamoring for more. We had to say, please turn the work in. Please turn the work in. We must turn the work in. That was what you did as Dave's editor. We tried threats. We tried cajoling. We tried bribery. And Dave was just immune to it. He had almost finished an entire Rocketeer story, and there's one panel left that had a bulldog in it. And that bulldog was completely inked except for one leg. He must have gone back to that paw I don't know how many times and redrawn it because he wasn't happy with it. His favorite drawing tool was his eraser. It was just driving me nuts. It was like, Dave, just ink it. Just ink it. You're, you'll be done with the book. Just finish it and you'll get paid. Clearly, he would have been more productive if he could just kind of let things go. But then he wouldn't be Dave. That's part of what makes this stuff so good is how kind of polished and beautiful it is. It's like a, like a diamond. You know, you can't rush a diamond. Later, when people were appreciating his perfectionism, it was paying off. It was in the earlier days when he was trying to be a comic book artist that it held him up. As time went on, especially with comics, he just became more and more frustrated, wanting to make sure that everything was there. The only grief I've had really has been on the printing end of it. It's a trash medium, <laughs> newsprint, toilet paper, with watered down color and watered down inks. So. I just have to take what I get and hope it comes out at least readable. The joke on Dave is his fixation on an end result 
He spent months to get the right color paint for his bathroom. Meanwhile, he's putting off deadlines and he's putting off work and he's avoiding work is what it amounted to. But it had to be right. You sense that Dave had the reputation of being so slow and so meticulous that some people were reluctant to hire him. And I'm sure that he lost a lot of gigs that way. I kept telling them, look, at best, it's going to be bi-monthly and maybe not even that. They didn't understand why I didn't just quit all my other <laughs> freelance gigs and do nothing but this strip. And I kept thinking, well, it's simple economics. I would starve. I think for everything, it was 150 a page. The writing, the penciling, the inking, the coloring, all of it. Those early days were kind of like the wild, wild west for comics. The publishers were working a lot of my shoestrings. I mean, they had some money, but they went out on that proverbial ledge, like, I'm going to publish 10 titles, and if seven click, then we're good. But if only four click, we're screwed. Pacific was distributing their own books, which is a bad thing to do. Eventually, it all caught up with them, and they just imploded, you know, bankruptcy. This is in 84. Within a matter of several months, Eclipse contacted me. They ended up publishing the last issue as a one-off. People kept bugging him about making a Rocketeer collection out of those short chapters. Dave didn't think he could do it by himself. He called me Hurricane Hernandez because he would say, draw this, and I would draw it, and then he'd go, oh, you're done. One of the pages he gave me was Betty tied up in the back of a car. I remember asking him, you don't want to draw Betty tied up? <laughs> and he was like, no, no, it's great. It's great. Go ahead. I was like, I thought this would have been your favorite page. Dave needed a production artist for the hardback Rocketeer. I describe it as being a midwife. Dave has done all the work of producing this baby, and he just needs a little help delivering it. And that's what I did. Dave was getting ready to recolor the collection. So he needed somebody to work cheap and fast, and he gave me a page to try out. And he said, don't get fancy, don't try to show off. And then I immediately did exactly, exactly the opposite. He looked at it and he went, yeah, you really screwed it up. <laughs> the rest of the page looked kind of okay. He's like, I think we can work with this. You, know, you got the job if you want it. It's like, okay, I'm working with Dave Stevens. So, so that was awesome. I helped him finish the book. I stayed at his house for two or three days, and we just drew back to back. And all the work paid off. The Rocketeer graphic album sold out, and Dave won awards. Right after he started getting famous and more popular, he was doing lots and lots of covers, and it seemed like every time he did a cover, he would, like, top himself. One of my favorite pieces of Dave's was the cover he did for Sheena. It was arguably one of the best covers Dave ever did. My favorite is that cover for Crossfire and Rainbow. As girls, as a celebrity, humor, and serious inking, it's got it all. Planet Comics 1. It's absolutely great because I love the fashion expressions, the body language. Alien Worlds. We used my sister as the model where the girl's climbing out of the crashed rocket. The Airboy cover with Valkyrie, that was amazing. The Marilyn Monroe cover of Crossfire is astonishing. There was a lot of it I adored. I love Dave's vampire a lot. The Mr. Monster cover is gorgeous. That is a favorite of mine. Dean Agent's cover with Rainbow with her legs up. It's so simple, but it's so beautiful. Her hair and the expression on her face, and that's one of the things that first spoke to me is like, wow, if you really have a good grasp of character and you've got the skill set, you can just make a, a drawing of somebody just sitting there, sing. It is so perfect in every way. Every eyelash is exactly right. There is no way you can improve that drawing, although I'm sure, given enough time, Dave would have thought of hundreds. There were some shenanigans going on at Eclipse and it left a real bad taste in Dave's mouth. I did uh, a smattering of covers and then left as soon as I could. Kamiko came along in 87 or 88. Bob Shrek was the editor and he had contacted me because we had known each other and he said, look, these guys will publish you and they seem solid. <laughs> we're like, yeah, the Rocketeer, Dave Stevens. I don't have to think about this, let's go. 
The Rocketeer Adventure magazine from Kamiko was the first new Rocketeer story in several years. Kamiko paid okay for those days, but there was never any back end in terms of royalties or anything like that. It was another one of those things where we thought we knew everything was happening, but, uh, you know, we hit that wall and that was it. The finances were gone and we folded. After Kamiko went bust, this guy came in and seized their assets or purchased them and started kind of soliciting for additional Rocketeer books that he hadn't even talked to me about. Dave's work was creator-owned. He wasn't going to just work for just some guy who happened to buy the name Kamiko. Yeah, he was just a clueless guy. He had no rights to the character at all, contractually. The last issue I was working on went in a drawer until this guy went away. I said, geez, why don't we do a pinup? We can sell it as a print and we can make some money. Oh, he was excited about that. Sure, let's do it. And he got his models and took photos and did Betty's bath. I admire Betty's bath, especially if you get to see the original and you get to look into those eyes. Like, Whoa. Dave was a master of respectfully portraying women. I mean, even with Betty's bath where she's naked, but she's covered up. Is it sexual? <laughs> I don't know, I don't care. It's so good that it doesn't really matter. One time Dave says to me, hey, would you like to see the perfect female body? We went to this shabby, crummy little dive and there are beautiful women walking around in bikinis or less. Finally, I said, okay, I give up. Which one is it? He said, it's not one. Imagine that girl's legs and that girl's torso. It's not one model, but a couple, and you're taking the best aspects of each to Frankenstein this thing together. Whatever it is that you see in your mind's eye, some of the best pieces have been done in that way. My sister Amanda posed for Dave several times. She was built like Betty Page on the backside. If you look at his early work for about the first 10 years, you start to see my body there, like Betty's bath, it's very obvious. If it's there in a the model, you just heighten it. You make the eyes bigger, you make the lips fuller, you, you know, make the cheeks more hollow or, or more arched. Dave was really obsessed with quality. He was a pain in the ass. Oh my God. We had to scrap an entire print run because he didn't like the way the paper looked. So we had to go on a different paper and I said, here's the paper, Dave, would you like to squeeze it? I got a call from John Landis one day to storyboard this music video with Michael Jackson called Thriller. And I said, John, I am up to my ears in work, but I've got this great studio mate, Dave Stevens. I don't think we really knew how big of a deal that Thriller video was. I mean, nobody made 20 minute long videos at that time. That was just unheard of. I said, so how'd the meeting go? Very strange. The whole meeting took place in his bathroom. I'm like, really? You were in the bathroom with Michael Jackson for a couple of hours. He says, you can't tell anyone, anyone, <laughs> where that meeting took place. And I said, are you kidding? I'm going to tell everyone. After the Rocketeer became a comic book sensation, the idea of making it into a movie was certainly something that was being bandied around. It was optioned first by director Steve Miner at the end of 83, I think. He renewed it for another year, but by 85, we hadn't come up with a story we liked, either one of us. Paul DeMeo and I met in college. He probably was the first one who picked up the Rocketeer. The only writing professor that Paul and I ever had was John Milius. He's the only one. And the best advice he gave, which I give to my own students, is write the movie you want to see the most. I met up with Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo in 85 through Jesse Horsting. He said, will you go with me into this meeting? And I said, sure, I'll go with you. Let's just listen to see what they have to say for themselves. Hey, Dave, you ever heard of this guy called the Creeper, Rondo Hatton? And it was like we had said some magic word or something. Dave was, I always wanted to do the Creeper. They and I just immediately hit it off. We were all just kids who didn't have much money. Dave gave us a free option on the movie. We never paid a nickel for the six years from that time until it became a movie that was just a friend agreement. 
and they were very excited the idea of the Rocketeer because they saw another Raiders of the Lost Ark in it. Dave and Paul and I put together a treatment for what the story of the movie would be. It wasn't this can be your Batman or Superman. We're pitching at it as an adventure movie like Doc Savage or Indiana Jones. And then I was contacted by a director named William Deere, who was just getting started doing a film called Harry and the Hendersons. So we kind of formed a little team between the four of us. How do you take this masterpiece of comics and move it to the screen and yet not lose the flavor that made it so popular? Was it about Betty? Was it about the airplanes? Was it about Cliff? I think for Dave Stevens, it was Betty, airplanes, Cliff. And then for us, of course, it had to be Cliff, Betty, Airplanes. <laughs> 86 would have been when we started making the rounds to every studio. Within a matter of a few months, we'd gone everywhere. Dave was getting frustrated at not hitting the bullseye on getting anybody to pick up the Rocketeer. We saved Disney for the last because, you know, we knew that we wouldn't make any money there. At a certain point, Steven Spielberg wanted to make the Rocketeer. Stephen said, if Disney doesn't want the thing, or they're not going to give you a good deal, I'll take it. I'll take it right now. Spielberg had everything to do with opening that door so he could sell that product to Disney. Word got back to Disney that Spielberg had tossed his hat in the ring. <laughs> Things got kind of nasty for a split second. I was having conversations with Dave about negotiating with Disney. He said, well, I still can't sit down. We're just going to have to all bite the bullet uh, if we want to get the thing made. But Honey, I Shrink the Kids was my first film. The picture was a hit, and Disney basically said, any other projects you, you might want to do? And I said, yeah, there's this graphic novel called The Rocketeer. I did not know at the time that Disney already had the rights and was involved with some phase of pre-production with Bill Deere. Dave had a little story in mind, you know, very character-driven, but Bill was thinking blockbusters, you know, so they kind of didn't dovetail. Before I knew it, we started our design phase and developing the script with Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo. They must have done four or five or six rewrites of the thing. At some point, we had another couple of writers come in. It's sort of typical of the way Hollywood scripts evolve. In those days, it would be like, first writer, OK, who's next? And then somebody else would do a draft. And there were other drafts. But there's one thing that never changed from the comic to the screen. And if it didn't change from the comic to the screen, that means it held the draft after draft after draft of the script. And that's the first time Cliff flies. Which was most like the comic and is probably my favorite part of the movie. You know, he's just going flat out 200 miles an hour straight up in the air, and I, I didn't think too much about graceful landings. It was really like slogging through, you know, a pecan pie to try to get the studio to sign off on it, because they always wanted changes. We wanted changes of our own that the studio wouldn't necessarily agree to, and it was just this sort of a constant battle, debate over what it's going to be. He's reaching for something that's in the comic. It's there. But getting in a movie with another 100 people, just damn difficult. Particularly one if you're going to do the subtleties that are the potential in The Rocketeer. In the comic, the Ginny character was based on Betty Page. I wanted Betty in the film, but Disney felt differently. There were only a few compromises as far as characters go, and Betty was one of those. The, the edgy stuff lasted through some drafts of the script. That we knew was going to have to change. That was not going to fly at Disney. <laughs> at the very least, going in, they were enthusiastic. But it was mainly because of the name, Rocketeer, Mouseketeer, and the fact that they looked at it and said, toys. Joe Johnston respected the comic. So Dave had an intimate experience with the movie that would normally not happen for a comic book artist whose book was licensed. In the beginning, he told stories like, I got kicked off the set. The set people liked him, but the higher-ups didn't, because he just had a big mouth, and he just wanted his thing done right. It was always about money. Joe Johnson had to squeeze every penny of that $43 million to get that on the screen, because my impression of the production was he was fighting for every inch. 
The main thing that I wanted to translate from the comic book to the screen was the way Cliff Secord looked in the outfit. If we got that right, everything else would more or less fall into place. How do I look? Like a hood ornament. At the same time, Dave knew there was a huge difference between a comic book and a film. He recognized that there were things that were going to have to change. There were arguments about the helmet design and the rocket design. Everything looked goofy when they were trying to make it look cool. Disney did not like the helmet. They thought it made him look like an insect. The helmet is such an iconic image of what the movie is. You can't really change that. They wanted to make it look like a NASA astronaut helmet. One of the Disney execs, he said, you know, it looks too old fashioned. Well, yeah, it's 1938. Johnson said, if that's what you're gonna do, I'm, I'm out of here. I really admired Joe Johnson for standing up for Dave and Dave's integrity like that. I thought that was pretty fantastic and pretty rare in Hollywood. The reason I wanted Bill Campbell as the Rocket Chips because he looked like the character. Dave was drawing himself, of course. Bill Campbell was a movie star. And in Dave's mind, that was um, him, in essence. And him and Billy Campbell became friends. Dave got a movie made of his character. It is now commonplace for creator-owned characters to become motion pictures. It was not when Dave made that happen. I just went for it. I, I threw in everything I loved as a kid and, and just stirred up the pot and threw it out there to see what kind of reaction I'd get. He made a real, full, honest-to-God Hollywood movie and had a real, honest-to-God Hollywood premiere. People love it. I thought it was charming and sweet and beautiful. Two thumbs up for The Rocketeer, a lighthearted and entertaining action fantasy. The only thing Dave said to me after the movie came out was that that's the version of The Rocketeer I would have made. Well, you know, you can't ask for more than that. The movie didn't fail. It was just not quite the hit they were hoping for. You, you watch it and you kind of go, I just want it to be a little bit more than what it is. I wanted him to see him do something with that rocket pack other than getting him from point A to point B. It had some terrific elements, but it didn't come together as a film. Dave may have been disappointed in some aspects of it, but I don't know of any filmmaker that's 100% satisfied with everything that they do. We had a deal in place to write the sequel. There was talk about a uh, World War II rocketeer story, a Cold War rocketeer story. And the box office wasn't big enough for them to even develop a script. Disney blamed him for Rocketeer not being a big hit. He wasn't happy with Hollywood after that. He realized how the game is played there. I knew that this chapter in my life was over. Looking back on it, I have to say I had the most fun on The Rocketeer than I have on anything else, you know, before or since. And The Rocketeer always worked. It just found the audience over time. You know, for me, it's disappointing. I mean, for everybody else, it's great. Let's talk about the movie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's old news. <laughs> when Dave was making The Rocketeer, one of the big pieces of advice that I gave him was, you're going to go into a deep, postpartum depression unless you start another project right away. At the studio, we always had in the back of our minds certain things that we would like to do if we got the opportunity. This is Wee Willie. This is the animation property that I'm working on in my spare time. It's another period piece, and it takes place in old LA. I recall thinking, wow, this is a perfect setting for Dave Stevens because a kind of a carny aspect to it, and Dave was fascinated by that world. If you've seen any of Dave's Christmas cards that he drew, he always portrayed himself as a newsie in the 1930s because that was the decade that Dave seemed to live in. I would see Wee Willie around a lot, and I would ask him, what is this? Mm, it's nothing. It was always just, mm, it's nothing. There are projects that you were really hot on and then you burn out on them and never touch them again. I had at least probably half a dozen like that. The Outriders was set in the 50s and it was about World War II veterans working out their experiences and their trauma from their war years through uh, building and racing hot rods. Kind of a tribute to hot rodding the way it used to be in uh, California, right around the, the war time. It was always one of those mysteries. I mean, as with many things, if you don't ask, they don't tell. He was working for years on a project in which Marla Duncan was the primary model. She was a very successful bodybuilder on many, many covers. Dave did a couple of really nice illustrations. I mean, it had an owl involved, and I'm like, okay, an owl. 
that's a great visual, but what's the story that leads up to that? I have no idea where that was going to go, but I knew he had something in mind. She was an adventurous. This French woman of mystery. Kind of an Arsene Lupin super thief. It's an illustrated novel called The Mad World of Mimi Rodin, kind of a psychic thriller, a horror story. I don't know if there was a reason he set Mimi Rodin aside. Be like, oh, eventually I want to get back to it. It could have been its own fantastic, marvelous, unique endeavor on its own if it ever happened. I knew that if I ever created anything of my own, whether it was in animation or comics or whatever, I would have to really be smart about what I signed. Cartoonists are notoriously bad business people. They've had me and a lot of other friends constantly giving him advice on how to make money, how to build upon what he'd created. And he would listen politely and then completely ignore us. Other artists have done quite well for themselves because they focused on the business side of being an artist. And they do quite well and, and the fans are happy and the artist makes money. Exploiting your creative property is a very collaborative business. Dave needed to trust in people, and he had a real hard time doing that. It's not like these guys who did the first comic book movies were making buttloads of money. They were getting paid chump change in many ways to give their creations to these people. There was never any huge Uncle Scrooge money vault. That's somebody else's life. The Rocketeer money. <laughs> <laughs> that was gone by the end of 91, and I used it to put it down on a little house in Long Beach and uh, ended up losing it in the real estate bust. He called me up and said, I found her. Betty Page is alive and well and living in California. Hopefully, at some point, we, we will meet. But, say la vie, we, we will see. She lived really close. I can't remember exactly how, but then he became friends with her. We would go to lunch, and then he'd go, I got to go see Betty. I got to take her to buy groceries. He was suddenly getting immersed in her life at that point. I think that's the sweetest thought ever, thinking of him and Betty driving around in a car. He says, Bill, it's a very strange world for me to be taking Betty Page to the pharmacy. <laughs> He says, I never thought that would be a part of my life. There's an emotional contact there. It's meeting someone who was part of your life long before you ever thought there was a chance of meeting them. He became very protective of her. He wanted to be a shield between her and the world. I would never say it, but I was going, when do I get to meet her? <laughs> you know, But I never pushed him on that. They wanted to know that the world really did remember her, so he would uh, kind of anonymously take her around to places so she could see just how much she was back in the public eye. In the 30 years since, had you ever seen any kind of evidence that your photos were still being reprinted in magazines? All of the interest in me after all these years, that's just something I don't understand at all. She gets so tickled when she sees some new book with her picture on it or some whatever product it is. They went by the golden apple. She's seeing this and this and that. I said, well, why didn't she go in the store? He goes, oh, I can't take her in there. Everybody recognize her. And I said, Dave. I said, well, she's 70 years old. I said, she can't have the same hairstyle. Well, yeah. She's legitimized, whereas back then she was sort of under the counter and not really given much, uh, if any, respect as a model, as an actress. I'm wondering if maybe some of it was gratitude because he had, I won't say exploited her image, but certainly benefited from it. Dave, from the very beginning, was hoping that he would be found because he wanted to share some of the monetary benefits here. Dave was the first person himself to pay her, and then Dave would hunt down other people who were using her image and force them to pay her as well. All the things that he did for Betty, he did that because, well, she deserved it, and she got cheated by everybody else. I have letters from her where she would tell Dave that he was the best friend she'd ever had, bar none. She did say she loved him very much. Betty Page is clearly Dave's muse. The respect he had for her and the, the world he built for her in his illustrations is just, will live on forever.
Jack Kirby. He was the creator or co-creator of most of the Marvel characters that are now worth billions. They started on his drawing table. He was a big influence when I was um, growing up, you know, with Fantastic Four and Captain America and the Avengers. He was probably the most creative man in comics. Jack was an early supporter of Dave and his talent, and I think he was certainly proud to have Dave in his work. He'd give me advice and tell me, psh, 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 don't get into comics, you know, be an illustrator. <laughs> he knew then that I was not suited to comic books, but I didn't realize what he was talking about, so it was uh, falling on deaf ears. Dave's influences in the comic book world were guys who had a very meticulous, specific style, and no line was ever out of place. Guys like Al Williamson. Al was invited to be a guest to Comic-Con in 1984. Dave and Al had never actually met. Dave came from one direction. Al came from another direction. Dave said, Dad. And Al said, Son. And they were inseparable for the whole rest of the convention. Wally Wood obviously was a huge influence. The few Starankos that hit town, and those really grabbed me. Jim Saranko was the younger punk who came out and did something sort of slicker and splashier than the previous generation. Dave befriended a lot of old artists. In my mind, it was like he was like collecting these guys. He admired their work, but also because they lived in the actual 30s, which is very interesting because he was born in 1955. I always thought that he was nostalgic for his parents' childhood. He'd never seen this time period, but he so loved it. Frank Frazetta was a big influence on Dave. I came into the whole Frazetta milieu at about 14, 15. Years later, when I did finally get to meet him, I said the work you did affected so many of us oh, so strongly yep. at, at a real pivotal age that we just did a complete 360 and started doing work that no way would we have been doing if not for having seen those images. He also loved a lot of the guys who were his contemporaries, Mike Kaluta and Bernie Wrightson, and he found the best in everybody's work to learn from. Guys like Bernie, guys like Dave, their art resembles who they are. There was a mutual admiration society. They were all so good at what they did. If you have the respect of other artists who you look up to, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the icing on the cake, that's it. You excel when you're surrounded by people who inspire you. You can see the comic book artists that did influence him, but he was influenced by so many different artistic movements. That's what kind of, I think, made him special. Because of my roots and my influences, I'd have to consider myself an American artist, but an artist who's very affected by the European sensibility. He loved Mooka, and he loved most anything Parisian and Art Nouveau, Art Deco. But I think his main inspiration were the old pinup artists from the 30s and 40s. I could see the DNA of Elvgren in Dave's work. Elvgren was like Norman Rockwell. Petty was so elegant. Vargas women were all made of satin soft. Enoch Bowles was just pure fun. It was interesting to, to see the way the men made these paintings of women, the, the kind of exuberance and sexuality that they were. Dave quickly became the guy to do sexy pinup girls for comics. Because he did move it up from the Petty and the Elfgrens. All of his own influences, he subsumed all of their stuff into his own unique style. I gotta be as good as that or better, and it's a trap. If you overbite what you can never chew, you're never gonna be happy. A lot of guys that let it consume their artistic identity. Dave Stevens never let, it, let that happen. And that's what a great artist does. You take your influences and you use that to express something personal. When I saw Dave's art, I was enlightened because I understood that inking was a part of the drawing. Brush inking is becoming a lost art. Frank Frazetta, Dave Stevens, Mark Schultz, Guys who fall in love with thinking with a brush, it's, it just has a whole different look than a, a pen does. I don't pencil all that tightly. My whole personality is in the inking. God, it was beautiful. He had control over that brush like nobody I've ever seen. His lines were so clean and so sharp and so well put together that it was kind of hypnotic. 
That's, that's like describing magic. You can describe how it makes you feel, but if you put it into words, that might take some of the magic away from it. Sometimes we do the mistake of conceiving the inking as a mere tracing of the pencil. No, because they've considered the anatomy, the light, the chiaroscuro. Sometimes I would go to his house and that same piece of art was sitting there <laughs> unfinished and I'd go, that looks really good. And he goes, ah, it's not finished. And I'd go, looks finished to me. <laughs> I know up here how I want it to look. I just don't think anybody inks like I do or close enough to where I'd be really happy with it. And I'm really uh, critical of my own work. He made sure that every line was there and if it didn't belong there, it was out. He was an annoying perfectionist. I probably knew him a lot better than most, but he still had his secrets. Dave Stevens was a very private individual, one of the most private I've ever met. He would tell me what he felt I needed to know, and not much more than that. It's just a personality type that we compartmentalize. He was multifaceted in that, and there was really not too many people who were parts of all that facet. He had his movie people, and he has fine art people, animation, architecture. Dave and I shared a passion for old Hollywood. He just loved that you could drive through LA and there's certain parts that looked so out of a Raymond Chandler novel, it was just incredible. Dave was really happy that there was still examples of that sort of 30s Hollywood ambiance still in little secret pockets around town. When he was into something, he would find someone who was also into that thing so they could commune about it. I was lucky, I got to overlap with several of the groups. He didn't have the comic people mix with the car people because the car guys were all old crotchety guys who were like, who are these nerds? It's funny, I mean, I feel like I knew Dave really well and yet I didn't know Dave well. We didn't talk about religion. We didn't talk about politics. We didn't talk about health or money because it somehow seemed ungainly in a very just sort of very gentlemanly way. I don't know why he had such a hard time talking about his feelings. I've considered that maybe he thought that these things he held so precious might be diminished by talking about them too much. If I think back, everybody wanted to be Dave's friend. And it was always, yeah, 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 hi, hi, hi. He had to have a, just a core of a few friends. You were worth it. You guys became pals for life. He was that way. For me and Gilbert, us hanging out with Dave was just like three buddies. You know, we weren't trying to get anything from him, and the same back, because Dave didn't want anything from me but just my friendship. I think people have multiple soulmates, and it's not just about being in relationships, like intimate relationships. It can be friendships, too. When I came down from getting a divorce, I was alone. All of a sudden, Dave's on the phone. Let's go to breakfast. Let's go to dinner. Let's go to the movies. After about three or four months, I realized I had a best friend. We were just guys fucking around, having a good time, and busting people's balls, you know, rather than being serious. In San Diego, we'd always go to this place called Pacers. It was a, a strip club. Strip clubs, yay! I have a lot of fun stripper stories. Occasionally, somehow they twisted my arm and dragged me along, and so I went to a few with Dave. He exuded an attitude that the girls enjoyed, so they'd always play up to him. And it was a really wholesome environment when Dave was around at a strip club. It was like going to Disneyland, except there were naked women. It was more like a fan rooting them on. But he was never salacious with the dancers, just an appreciator of beauty, you might say. Dave and I were in Portland for the 1990 convention, and we wanted to go to a strip club. Dave's throwing money out and hooting and hollering. She's dancing, she got only high heels on. And I say, take your shoes off! <laughs> She's dancing, she like stops and goes, what? I'll give you 10 bucks to take your shoes off. And she goes, you're a pervert. Dave lost it. He was laughing so hard. He's like, you're a pervert. <laughs> Dave was very much the male version of that Betty Page thing. Good girl during the day and the naughty girl at night. In the back of my mind, I always thought, Dave wants to be a real outlaw, but he could never be as bad as he thought he wanted to be. 
Dave said, I almost got to meet Orson Welles. And he starts to tell me why he didn't get to meet Orson Welles when suddenly this beautiful woman came up behind him and said, hey, Dave. And he's like, oh, hey. And she put her hand on his shoulder and, and she leaned over and whispered something and Dave got up and left with this young woman. And I sat there for a second. Then I looked over at John Kukasakis and I said, are they f You know, <laughs> and John just went, mm-hmm. To his credit, Dave came back about an hour later, sat back down, went, <sighs> Anyway, so I didn't get to meet Orson Welles because he died. There's definitely artists out there who draw women in a way that can objectify. But I think that there's a beauty in Dave's drawings. Let's not be coy about it, you know. He liked tits and ass and nakedness. The key, I think, is he captured more than the surface. He captured the spark in their eyes. I try always to portray women sexy, but of course in a respectful way. Dave did this very, very well. As a woman, who the hell wouldn't want to be drawn by Dave Stevens? My God. He loved to do female figures, and I think he really put a lot of effort into being top-notch at it. But I think it was a favorite field of study, you know what I mean? <laughs> he didn't mind practicing. There's a playfulness, there's an artistic beauty to it, and a balance. There's one cover in particular to me that really stands out. It's a self-portrait with Dave, very cartoony of him, and then just a gorgeous drawing of an exotic dancer. I think that really shows how much he respected and loved the female form. Sometimes I think he's looking for something unattainable. There was perfection that he saw in his mind. I don't know if he actually worked on his appearance, but he had a good sense of style and he was a good looking dude. I love seeing old pictures of him when he was really young and he was kind of a tall, skinny, you know, nerd. Dave had a little bit of an ego and he was a little bit vain about his appearance. I remember him standing in the doorway of the bathroom, just watching him primp. <laughs> Jaime mean, Hernandez coined it best when he said, Dave's the prettiest man in comics. He was the most beautiful boy in comics. All artists have a sense of self. He, was, he always was art directing himself in a way. He was neatly turned out on all occasions, and he preferred retro clothing, and he picked that out meticulously. He carried a style with him into the world, but never flamboyantly like his friend Jim Steranko, who's quite a flamboyant guy. They cared about how they presented themselves to the world. Over the years, he would change his sideburns and mustache and goatee. The sideburns. You could shave with Dave's sideburns. They were so sharp and crisp. As you could say, it was vain, but it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a detriment to his character. Oh, it's not vain. It's having self-esteem. I never saw Dave with a hair out of place, but... Uh... I did see Dave with a pirate shirt. The famous pirate shirt incident. His puffy pirate shirt. The Earl Flynn pirate shirt. It worked for him, and he felt comfortable with it. But that doesn't mean you can't make fun of it. <laughs> hey, Dave, got the puffy shirt. He goes, why didn't somebody tell me that? He goes, do you know how hard it is to find a shirt like this? And I said, yeah, there's a reason for it. That big pirate shirt. That was the first chink in the Dave Stevens armor ever. <laughs> it just kind of went <sighs> He was just going through life and playing with the tools that God gave him. The thing about him is he loved women. And not in a dirty way, he just loved women. And that's what got him into all kinds of trouble. <laughs> Dave was a very sweet guy. And he was very honest. That was part of why women gravitated towards him. I couldn't believe when Dave called me and said, you're not gonna believe what just happened. I'm like, what? Well, he had one girl in the bedroom and he gets this knock, knock, knock. <laughs> he had one knocking on the door, he had one in bed, and he had the other, a third one on the phone. And he's like, what are you doing? You know you're not supposed to come over without calling first. Because, you know, he had a whole litany of rules. You can't come over. You can't just pop in to Dave Stevens' house. It wasn't an erotic story. It was a guy who got caught being too nice to too many girls. 
how much of this is Dave and how much of this is them? I'm sure there's a, a middle ground somewhere. I think his marriage taught him a lot of things. This was an excerpt from a letter that Dave wrote to me. Charlene, I had my mind set on the kind of wife I wanted, and whenever you proved to be otherwise, I imploded, I panicked. I know now that the worst thing I could have done, I did, I left. I had to have things perfect and my way or I wouldn't play. There was definite love, just not the obvious kind of love. Although we tried, I mean, we tried to like kind of look like a couple, we just failed so miserably. It was hard for him to make those compromises that relationships need. It was always, okay, that's enough. I'm done. I'm going over here now. <laughs> Here was my hobby. It was something I did in my spare time. That's why there are so few of them, because I wasn't all that interested in doing a huge number of comics. Dave waited out the guy that bought up the Kimiko assets. About three years went by, and he was free to take it where he wanted to, and that was Dark Horse. This is the last Rocketeer story that uh, I have yet to complete that's been sitting unfinished for quite a while. As time went on, Dave's love of comics was slowly waning. Luckily, he had people he knew at Dark Horse, so it was a little easier for him there. We'll see if people like it. If they don't, well, it's too bad. <laughs> I got the kind of ironic pleasure of watching Bob Shrek standing in the shoes that I had been standing in long before, trying to wrangle the pages of Rocketeer from Dave Stevens. And it didn't work any better for Bob than it did for me. He was definitely having struggles the further and further we went. They had a deadline, and Dave can't meet a deadline, so bring in the troops. The two guys who wrote the script for the film, Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo, wrote with me the last two chapters. The Rocketeer was our first comic we wrote. When it came to laying out the panels and editing, it's a completely different art form. Paul and I were just like, wow, this is way more time consuming and way harder than we thought. <laughs> Dave was always looking to get assistance to help him out on The Rocketeer. Of course, in the, the second story that he did, the, the New York Adventure, he actually had a lot of help. He needed people who could really draw. David said, he's up against the wall, would I do breakdowns? I said, well, I'll try. And I remember calling him up saying, sorry, buddy, this looks like crap. He said, oh, that's perfect, that's all I need. The thing about Dave, it sounds weird to say, but I don't think drawing came easy to him, even though he drew from a very early age. He said that starting with a blank sheet of paper is like the scariest thing. He's like, I don't really know what I want to draw. I did a few backgrounds for him. Gary Gianni did one page. Arthur Adams, Sandy Plunkett, these French guys, Stan Manoukian and Vince Rocher. They would help him finish up the book so that they can get it published. They came through and got it done. I used to go over to Dave Stevens' studio. But I do remember seeing pieces of Rocketeer that weren't part of any of the published material yet. The Rocketeer art that could have been. So I've still got file folders full of plots and characters and all that. Cliff and Betty go to the desert and there was a giant Tesla coil. PVs disappeared and because something, 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 blah, blah, blah. It was during World War II and he was going to end up on Skull Island got the rocket pack, and he's on this island full of dinosaurs. Holy cow, now there, now you're talking. When he did that last issue of The Rocketeer, that came out pretty much when the, when the come up market was crashing. Dark Horse had to contract, and basically Dave got the cut. The whole experience of jumping from one, two, three, four publishers in a, a span of maybe a handful of years, it just drummed all the enthusiasm out of me. In the years since, I've suggested a couple of miniseries or two-issue things. He's like, I want to do Superman and the Rocketeer, and it's like, huh? I did make that three-issue pitch at DC for that Rocketeer-Superman crossover in 1998 that was met with complete resistance. I didn't see any artwork for it, but he had the Rocketeer, Superman, and the Orson Welles broadcast about the Mars invasion kind of a Max Fleischer Studios of Superman. It was a cool idea, but there were some issues in the story that DC objected to. 
When you do a crossover with a major company, everything has to be very balanced for them. And apparently it wasn't balanced enough. I've since given the uh, scripts to two or three other editors there and never heard from them again. Did I write really crappy stories or is it just a thing of bad timing? After the movie and after the debacle with DC and Rocketeer and Superman, I think he lost a whole lot of interest in this stuff. The thing that he was recognized for or regarded for at some point, he started to move away from it. I kind of feel like he was a little bit lost. He didn't really know what to do with himself at that point. I just felt so stale and useless. I just didn't care to put out bad work anymore. So I just stopped. The death of any creative individual is to go, I'm done learning. Um, now I'm just going to coast on what I know. And that was one of the reasons that I got so dissatisfied with everything I was doing from probably 92 on until about 99. Okay, if I can't bear to draw comic books anymore, maybe I can set this alternate thing, being a painter, on fire if I go back to school like I should have done years ago. And I went to work for the LA Art Academy, and when Dave learned about it, he decided that he's going to come to my class. He had this sort of idea and attitude of like, I always have to better myself, and I can do better. To be a great artist, you need to always be striving to be better, and I think Dave always did that. Dave was embarking on the painting journey, and it has a learning curve. The seeds were there, the eye was there, the technique wasn't there yet. Class after class, one right after another every term, all I was after was just trying to bring the game up. If that's his response to being dissatisfied with his work, then that's a good response. That's a healthy response, you know, because he's being proactive about it. You got to hand it to the guy for having that, that kind of humility. I have never heard of any other artist doing that. To admit that at 42, and I'm admitting that to having just turned 50, it's scary. You definitely feel like you need to continue your education or you just wither away. It's heartbreaking to see somebody doing some virtuoso drawing or painting and then to slowly see them sort of get lazy and sit back and then before you know it, they're doing really mundane hack work and they never rise to it again. He always felt that there was another artist he could learn from. It's interesting being the teacher of someone like Dave. Even the greatest athletes have a coach. And even though they can outperform their coach, they need that second set of eyes. And you need someone with a level of experience that can spot your blind spots and point them out to you. It's probably going to take me the rest of my life to get facility enough to where I can just start laying it down and know that I'm not going to foul it up. I went around to the students and asked them, how many paintings per week do you want to commit to do? I, I recommend at least one. Three if you're serious, and Dave said five. Week one, five, week two, five, 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 all the way through the 10 weeks of class. He came through every single week. He was a very serious student. He was just so jazzed. I hadn't seen that fire in him in quite a while. He was trying to reach another level to do something, accomplish something, try something harder than he had ever done before. This is the Black Dahlia. He designed it beautifully. He makes the most of all the ordinariness of it. The expression in the eyebrows and just the casual quality of the lips. Then you look at her eyes, there's something completely like disarming. When you do get close to successful with one of those, that's the best payoff of anything. It's just knowing that you caught whatever it was about that person in that split second, and it's rare. He really had everything going for him. And then God, of course, drop kicked him out of the universe. Right after we were sharing time in the art schools, Dave and I, he was having some trouble. I knew that something was going on. He wasn't shy about it, but it wasn't a topic of conversation. He called me. My wife was in the room. She suddenly burst into tears. He said, hey, I have to, I have to talk to you about something, and I don't, I don't want you to get upset. Well, there's a blood problem. A blood problem? What does that mean? And he finally kind of sat us down and explained what was going on. After further tests and things, they determined that it was hairy cell leukemia. Just a very rare blood cancer that attacks the marrow, basically, in the bones. 
And while it is treatable for a while, ultimately, that's one of those cancers they haven't quite really gotten to the bottom of, unfortunately. You know, I said, well, is this something to worry about? He goes, I don't think so. I don't know why Dave wanted so much to keep it quiet, but he did. That was his business. He just suffered through that silently. Jim Silk had called me up and he said, I want to tell you something, although he did not want me to tell you, but I said, God damn it, he's your friend and he should know and I'm gonna tell him because you can trust him. So I didn't know what to think. And then it became public knowledge that he was quite ill. He got mad. When he was mad at me, he said, you told somebody. I said, I haven't talked to anybody. There were a couple of relationships that became pretty strained. He would do a few things arbitrarily that he wouldn't have done if he hadn't been sick, very, very sick. I would call him and he wouldn't pick up and he'd call him again and I'd be like, look, dude, you either pick up the phone or I'm gonna call your mom and she's gonna get you to call me. Well, he picked right up. And I'm like, okay, so what's the story? He said, somebody told that I have this leukemia. Our conversations never really talked about death or anything like that, it was always, he was always trying to be up about it. I'm happy that there were people around him who were able to help him because how do you go through something like this by yourself? He told me he would need some more help from time to time. He would need me maybe to get groceries for him every now and then. I'd be visiting and I'd be hanging out and we'd go spend three hours at Kaiser Permanente. I drove him to the chemo because that's a killer. For hours you're miserable every time you do it. I'm always optimistic. Now you know you have this illness, and let's hope that the treatment really improves quality of life. My dad felt if he prayed hard enough, Dave would not have to go through chemo. And I think he really had a hard time wrestling with the fact that his prayers were not answered. He had just come home from chemotherapy, and he saw himself in the mirror. He was able to draw himself in the anger and the frustration, the pain. There's nothing as bitingly real as anything else in his art. It's a whole different look at the world. And I guess he could do it because it's himself. I never thought about it that way until just now. Nobody was seeing Dave as much as we used to, and I think he was sensitive about people seeing him sick. I've got a heart problem, a kidney problem. But we could laugh about it. It was dark humor. I'd say, you know, I'm going to tell him about the puffy shirt. I'd say, ah, you can't tell him that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he wanted to be at the Comic Con, but he wanted to look healthier and more robust than he really was. Dave used to literally pump himself up. He would get a bunch of blood transfusions to withstand the rigors of exhibiting for four days. This went on for years. And he'd go, I'm done signing. I got to go lie down. And then he goes, but it's no big deal. He was worried people were going to stop giving him work. So he really didn't want to lose that because he had all these bills coming in. The illness did affect his ability to work because almost all treatments for cancer affect you physically, usually sap your energy. As far as his career is concerned, Dave's trying to be very optimistic. You know, he had one more project to do. He wanted to get it done. After the treatments, instead of resting, he would just dive right back into work. <laughs> he was trying to keep as many projects in the air as he could. Around 2006, Dave started working on Brush With Passion. The second the book was a go, what he really wanted to do was recolor some of the old artwork because, well, it wasn't up to snuff. If he had drawn it one way earlier in his life, and now it was coming up for publication again, he was as likely as not to completely redo the thing because that older stuff just wasn't good enough for him. Two friends of mine, Kelvin Mao and David Mandel, asked if I would be interested in digitally coloring a couple of pinups for Brush of Passion. Laura Martin is one of the premier colorists in comics, you know, and she has been for a long time. Computer coloring was relatively new, and Dave was, let's say, a little bit unsure. I sort of convinced him to give her a few pieces to try. The Catwoman piece was a darker palette, and the Aurora piece was much brighter. I wanted to get the sun on the skin, the brighter tones that suggest a completely different lighting situation. 
There were some exchanges, a few little minor changes, but he was very impressed and really happy with the results. It was a little heartbreaking watching Dave work on Brush With Passion during his illness. It really gave him something, I think, each day to sort of look forward to and to do and kind of kept his spirits up, but then also at the same time was sort of draining. I remember the moment when other people had to buy Dave his groceries, and I thought, Dave used to do that for Betty, and now people are doing it for him. Dave said he didn't want anyone to tell Betty. I think she had a little bit of dementia going on too, so she wasn't as lucid as they thought. My feeling was sort of like, well, you've helped her so much. She should know that there's a reason that you're not around. And he said, no, absolutely not. I don't want Betty to know. When he got sicker, we had a dinner together. He said, take care of Betty. He was worried about her. So he's not going to say goodbye. He's just going to literally fade away. And I think, honestly, to the day she died, she didn't know. Meanwhile, Dave was taking art classes, and he was helping me teach, and he fell in love in the middle of that sickness. She was one of the women that he was dating that had become the woman, Amy. Dave was an absolute bona fide, incurable romantic. He will never say it, he'll deny it. But his feelings go very, very deep. When he finally realized that she was the one and that it just wasn't going to happen, he got very, very blue about that. Not only was he ill and depressed from chemo, but the demise of the relationship added to that. That was a really kind of hard, dark time for him. He was hurt. He was hurt. I didn't know how to calm him. In November of 2007, he wound up in the hospital, and that's when they found out that he had congestive heart failure, and that was as a result of the chemo. Literally, he had lasted nine years with this, and I thought he was going to last longer. You know, something was going to happen. He was sick. He was weak. Really hear it in his voice. And that really shook me up and scared me, you know. Dave was really determined to just work on this book as much as possible. I would sneak into the hospital, and I would give him these signature plates to sign, because he wanted to do a big signed and numbered edition. When we were in the hospital, he and I had a conversation about who knows, who should I tell? Who doesn't know that needs to know? You know, I kind of gently urged him, you know, now it might be about time to, to, like, let your close friends know. We started just one by one calling them. In the end, he, he said, you know, you did good. It was really nice to see him in those last few weeks to really get to spend time and see everybody. Our mom went down to stay with him December through March. And I'm sure that was just an absolutely horrible experience for the both of them because their personalities were kind of oil and vinegar. He said, they're throwing all my shit away. You gotta watch every step. His mom and sister were there and they were going through his shit. And Dave was freaking out going to Kukasakas. Hide the porn, hide the porn. Yeah, we were in our 50s and we we're like, God, we're just like little kids. Like, oh no, mom's going to catch us with the Playboy magazine. Dave just shook his head after she left us. Oh, I can't believe we're in this much trouble. I said, I'm not in trouble. You're in trouble. When he was told by the doctor that he had probably maybe six months to live, he was like, well, I thought I had a lot longer than that. He said, I can't take care of myself anymore, Jim. I've got to go live with mom. He'd just be like, I'll see you soon. I'm not gone. I'm just, I'll be there. And he was always very positive about it. He was so frail. He was like 100 years old. And he stood up. And I said, OK, man, I'm going to hit the road. Take care of yourself. And he came over. And the only time I'd ever hugged this guy in 25 years. He said, I'll see you around. And I left. We said goodbye, and I got up, and I put my hand on his shoulder, squeezed it, and left. It was tough.
Being an artist is a very solitary lifestyle. You sit in a room by yourself and you draw. Dave Stevens was a once-in-a-lifetime artist. His compositional skills, his techniques were incredible. You can't look at one of his finished inks and not be in awe of it. Dave carved out his own particular corner of artistic importance. He influenced a lot of people. You could look at Dave's life and go, this is what it's like to pursue a life as a creative individual. You can't just crank it out. You can't just do it for the money. There's got to be something genuine to it, and Dave was genuine. You want to know who David Stevens was? Look at what he drew. There's a certain magic involved. That intensity, that detail, that love, that passion for what he's doing, and the obsession with it. Those of us who knew him feel privileged. That's a selfish way of looking at his legacy, but it's valid. It's one of my regrets. I wish I had stayed in touch with him. The Rocketeer is a timeless piece of work. It may be a finite and short story, but it's among the best. I think of me in my bedroom with a Rocketeer comic book under the covers with a flashlight, being so deeply pulled into someone else's vision, it changed the way I saw life, beauty, reality, love. Dave created this perfect combination of this helmet and this jetpack. And as a kid, you could take an old oatmeal canister, a bicycle helmet with a cardboard fin, fly around and have adventures. I love that aspect of it. His legacy is what a refined comet can look like. He's unique, and uh, he says, wish there was more of it. He says, I'm not interested in quantity. I'm interested in quality. How many people leave a body of work that is timeless and that will be admired? The same way Dave admired Frazetta or Steranko or Jack Kirby. Other artists will have Dave in similar lists. He's part of the lineage of the pinup artists. He follows suit into people like Adam Hughes and some of the newer comic book artists that are coming along. Several years after we had met, I had the newly released laser disc of the Rocketeer film. Widescreen, it was a very, very thrilling time. And Dave signed it to Adam, the reigning king. I was so moved by that, you know, and I said, Wow, man, I can't believe you wrote that. And Dave looked at me and said, well, I don't want the job. <laughs> if you do good work and it's available, young artists are going to keep seeing it and take inspiration from it. Without even knowing him, he was able to reach me in a very small town in Italy. It's a chain. Everybody's passing his torch, and that's what a great mentor is. He contributed to create artists. Dave passed away in 2008, and at that point, Rocketeer had been out of print for basically a decade. A small group of friends uh, slowly convinced Dave that might be a good idea. Let it have its rebirth. A few weeks before he passed away, he sat me down with his mom, and he said he trusted Dave Mandel and I to do it right, and you know, he gave us basically his blessing. But of course, nothing's ever that easy, especially when it comes to Dave. Ultimately, we were really lucky enough to end up with IDW and Scott Dumbier. The first book that came out was the Rocketeer Deluxe Complete Adventures, oversized hardcover. It's got uh, the entire Rocketeer series. They were willing to do the book the way Dave would have wanted to do it, including a top to bottom recoloring by Laura Martin. All I wanted to do was to provide Dave's vision. I wanted to be the set of hands that Dave didn't have. At some point, I remember just kind of looking to Kelvin and just kind of going, we're going to do our best, and let's just be sort of confident that no matter what we do here, Dave would figure out a way to find fault with it. It was a big success. I take great pride in the achievement that we all did. It's definitely a privilege introducing a whole new generation of fans to the Rocketeer but it is bittersweet that Dave's not here to see it. The Eisner Awards are the Oscars of the comics industry. 
to be in the Hall of Fame, your first professional work has to have been at least 35 years ago. Dave was elected in 2019 and the minute he became eligible. If Dave were still alive, I think he'd be making more motion pictures. As ratty as the film business can be, I think there was a special place in it for Dave and his ideas. I would like to sit down with Dave and watch The Rocketeer. I could say, Dave, if I could do this again, I would change that. How about you? I'd like to think that he would have circumnavigated the self-introspection globe and come back to comics. He would have continued to work, continued to feel insecure, continued to just beat his head against the desk, trying to get better and just to get to the next level. He would be a force right now in that painting field because he would have had the education by now, and that's the one thing he always wanted. He had so many works in progress. Those things probably would have been finished at least to the point where we could have said, this is perfect, and he would have said, no, it's not. It's amazing how much you can miss a guy like that. It's the attraction to their sense of character and what you share. But you do miss him. His life and his art will live forever. He had a lot more to do, Dave Stevens. He had a lot more to do. All my adult life, the clock has been my enemy. There's never been enough time because I've never made good use of it. It seems to me that one of the worst things a creative person can do is to squander his talents on meaningless, trivial, selfish pursuits which benefit no one. And the greatest shame in an artist's career would be to leave an endless trail of unfinished works and abandoned projects which clearly had endless potential all lost to time and indifference. That is something that terrifies me, and rightly so. My growth and potential has largely been limited only by my own lack of foresight and commitment. Maybe I'll get there, maybe not. But at least I can look in the mirror and know that I am trying my very best. Sum up Dave Stevens in three words. Three words? <laughs> so many words you can use about Dave. Handsome, brilliant, and funny. Handsome, funny, and brilliant. Buddy, mate, friend. Impeccable, perfectionist, and sweet. Generous, intractable, and determined. Extraordinarily talented. Perfectionist. Visual, collaborative. Artist. Two words are master illustrator. Dreamer. Guy was always dreaming about something. Vivido. Meraviglioso e comunicativo. Interminably fantastic art. Handsome, dashing, and gone. Particular, understated, important. Born too late. World's most fastidious. Proper, wry, and absolutely committed. Meticulous, kind, and stubborn. It's fine, Dave. It's great, Dave. A man's man and a woman's man. In three words, my only husband. My best friend. No true, real answer. Tits and ass. Talented. That's an understatement. My favorite artist. Two words. Fucking Dave. <laughs> <laughs>